Robots perform many underwater tasks which are impossible or too risky for scuba divers to carry out, like collecting samples from the ocean floor for scientific research, exploring shipwrecks, inspecting underwater pipelines, searching for planted explosives, or recovering bodies. This particular underwater robot is designed to find unconscious drowning victims. Recent incidents have shown that a person recovered within 90 minutes can survive without brain damage when rescuers follow a specific resuscitation protocol. The robot uses a protruding interlocking jaw to grab the victim by a limb and haul him or her to the surface. Its onboard camera gives operators at the surface an underwater view. When the water is too murky to see anything, video enhancing technology and imaging sonar detect the outline of objects. Several thrusters propel the robot through the water. For each one, technicians grease, then position a pair of O-rings onto end caps that they install on each end of the thruster housing. The O-rings seal the end caps, keeping water out of the motor located inside the housing. The motor shaft protrudes through the propeller end cap. A mechanical bale secures both thruster end caps to the housing. They fill the thruster with oil. This prevents the thruster from imploding under pressure as the robot descends deeper and deeper. After filling, they draw a vacuum to remove any air bubbles and draw the oil into every nook and cranny. Then they install a reservoir, which they also fill with oil. When the underwater pressure builds, this backup oil supply fills any remaining minuscule air gap the vacuum might have missed. They close the reservoir with a sealing screw to prevent any oil from leaking out. Now they turn their attention to the thruster's main component, a two-blade propeller made of durable nylon. It goes on the back end of the thrusters. They install the camera chassis onto the robot. This chassis also carries the majority of the robot's electronics, such as the computer, communications equipment, and lighting. Here they're hooking up the belt for the tiny motor, which tilts the camera to look up and down. They cover the camera chassis with a transparent acrylic dome called the viewing port. A cap with an O-ring seal keeps water out. They install the robot's power supply at the opposite end of the robot, then encase it in a metal tube sealed on both sides with an end cap and an O-ring. For the thrusters to work at maximum efficiency, the robot must be neutrally buoyant, meaning neither too light nor too heavy. So once the robot is fitted with all its thrusters and electronics, technicians install the main float. Certain models have additional floats. They cap each propeller with a vented cover called a court nozzle. This isolates the water flow, maximizing the propeller's efficiency. These bumper frames act like bumpers on a car. They absorb the force of impact, protecting the robot from damage when it encounters underwater objects. The bumper frames also serve as a structure to attach lights and other components, as well as specialized tools such as that quick release jaw, which grabs the victim by a limb. They install the jaw at an angle so that it doesn't block the camera's view. Now the sonar unit. It also mounts to the bumper frames. The sonar projects a 130-degree left-to-right 3D image onto a monitor at the surface, showing the outline of objects around the robot. Finally at the top, they install a strobe light a flashing beacon that tells rescuers on the surface exactly where the robot is. Every underwater robot goes out for a test drive. They submerge it in a tank, which is essentially an aquarium inhabited by fish of the stick-on variety. These inanimate creatures adhered to the glass provide colorful images on which testers can focus and unfocus the camera. From there on in, the first mission in open water awaits.
From the home workshop to the factory floor, the bandsaw is one of the most popular power tools around. It's called a bandsaw because the blade is a metal band with teeth that moves continuously in a loop around two or three rotating wheels. It can make straight, curved, and angled cuts. This is an industrial bandsaw designed to cut wood, aluminum, and composite materials such as plexiglass. It can cut pieces up to 12 inches thick and can divide a board up to 40 inches wide into two equal sections. The tabletop tilts to a maximum 45 degrees for angled cuts. It's made of sturdy cast iron. The bandsaw manufacturer purchases it from a nearby foundry, then uses a rotary grinder to make the surface, as we can see on the right, smooth and shiny. One of the saw's key components is this lower bearing case. It links the motor to the lower of two cast iron wheels which turn the saw blade. Workers will later mount that lower wheel on one end of the bearing case shaft. Now, on the opposite end of the shaft, they mount the drive pulley. The motor will rotate the drive pulley, turning the shaft and consequently, the lower wheel on the opposite end, which moves the saw blade looped around the lower and upper wheels. Those cast iron wheels, meanwhile, need a rubber edge to ensure the blade moves smoothly and without slipping. Workers position a guide over the first wheel, then slip a rubber band onto the guide. Next, they coat both the edge of the wheel and the rubber band on the guide with contact cement adhesive. Then they carefully pull the rubber band off the guide, flip it over, and press the glued side against the glued surface of the wheel. The first wheel now has a rubberized edge. They repeat the same procedures for the second wheel. In the meantime, another department has welded the bandsaw steel cabinet. After the cabinet gets a paint job, workers begin installing the various components. Among them, the support assembly for the upper wheel. Behind the wall on which they mount the upper wheel, down at the bottom and protruding forward through the hole in the wall, they install the support for the lower wheel. This support is the shaft of the lower bearing case, the side opposite the drive pulley. After mounting the lower wheel, they move behind the wall, install an electric motor right below the lower bearing case, and link the two with a pair of belts. So now when the motor runs, the pulley rotates and the lower wheel turns. Next, they bolt in the tabletop. It tilts on trunnions, pairs of mating half-circle cast iron supports, one attached to the table's underside, the other to the cabinet's table frame. Now for the most critical part of the assembly process. Workers use this jig as a precision guide to align the wheels. The wheels must be perfectly balanced to keep the saw blade stable while it's cutting. Once the alignment's complete, workers remove the jig and loop the steel saw blade around the two wheels. They adjust the blade to the correct tautness by simply setting the tension gauge to the width of the blade. And finally, the last step. Above the tabletop, they mount bearings which guide the blade. Without these, the blade would wobble or drift offline due to the force of cutting through the wood or other hard material. Now, just a final check to ensure everything runs smoothly and make absolutely sure this bandsaw is up to speed when it comes to cutting construction materials.